I was born in Massachusetts, so I'm sort of a long way from home, halfway across the country, and um, grew up in a little town on the ocean called Swampscott. Went to um, school and then college at Radcliffe and then medical school at, at, Harvard, at uh, Tufts. So I've been sort of a New England product. But then after medical school, I decided to um, move with my first husband to DC. He was at going to NIH and I started a pathology residency at Georgetown. Now I had originally been planning to be a pediatrician until my third year of medical school when I decided um, that pediatrics was not for me and that was because I was on a pediatrics rotation and I realized you couldn't play with kids. You um, really had to do things to them, not all of them pleasant. So um, I was thinking of internal medicine, um, but in my fourth year I was pregnant with my first child, my daughter, who was born right after graduation. So I did a year of pathology at Georgetown and I loved it and I didn't expect to. I expected to do a year and then to go back into internal medicine. And while I was doing the year of pathology, I was offered a residency at NIH. So I moved over to NIH and spent three years in an anatomic pathology residency there, which was wonderful because it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of research. And after that, I did a one-year research fellowship with Ruth Kirstein at NIH at the Division of Biologic Standards, which really got me used to doing a lot of what we would now call translational research projects, but we didn't call it that then. And after that year, my department chairman, Abner Golden, offered me a faculty job at Georgetown, and I moved back. I stayed in the same house, but I moved physically back to Georgetown and was a faculty member there. I remarried during that time, had two kids at that point, my oldest son and my daughter, and my husband, who I'm married to now for 43 years, is a pathologist also here, Dr. Ralph Powell, who's in the department here. And uh, he and I um, decided to move with Abner Golden to Lexington, Kentucky. Now, this was a huge move. Abner had been my first pathology chairman as an intern and then my pathology chairman as a junior faculty member. And he was moving to take over the chairmanship of pathology at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. When I heard about it, I said, where? <laughs> Lexington, what? <laughs> and, um, so, so we decided to go and look. And um, we went to Lexington, my husband and I, and Abner told us there were two great jobs. Tad would run the pathology department at the VA hospital there, and I would be head of anatomic pathology. Um, as a brand new associate professor at this university. Well, the problem was there was no one there. The whole department had left. There were two other pathologists at the VA, and um, the only other pathologist at the university was a retired pathologist who sat in his office all day. The medical students had no one to teach pathology that year, so they were actually reading Robin's textbook of pathology as their pathology course. And the thing that really made me decide to go to Kentucky with Abner was meeting with a group of medical students. And I had never seen a medical student wearing overalls before. These were bib overalls. And the University of Kentucky, mo many of their students came from Eastern Kentucky and from Appalachia. And this young man, I don't know his name, but he really was an influence on me because he said, I hope you all come, we need you bad. And how could you not go? Because they needed us, and they really did. So we, we went, um, we went in January, Abner and Tad and I, and a young man who had just finished his residency, Willie O'Connor, and he went with us. And one of the faculty members at Georgetown drew a cartoon, which I wish I still have, of Lil Abner, and I was Daisy May, and we were off to Kentucky to take over pathology. And we worked really hard. I mean, I, I read surgicals and did cytologies by myself. Abner ran the autopsy service. Tad went over to the VA. And I did this for about three weeks, and finally I said to my young colleague, Willie, who had just finished his residency, do you think you could cover cytologies 
for a week um, while I do the surgicals. And we limped along recruiting faculty as quickly as we could. And we recruited a wonderful group of faculty over the years. Um, many of them are still in Kentucky. And it was, it was a great time. We were working really hard. Um, the pathology department was really appreciated. The students were great. Um, and Abner, who I think was one of my most important mentors, believed in medical education. And so he believed that it was really important that we become great teachers for our students. And we did. So um, we were very happy there. We stayed in Kentucky for 21 years. Abner had to retire when he was 65. He dragged it out to 67, but Kentucky made him do that, and we were searching for a new chairman. And by that time, we had been there for 10 years. And the dean, Emory Wilson, at that time interviewed a lot of people, and my faculty kept saying, you should be a candidate. And I said, no, no, no. And they said, yes, we want you. So I was a candidate, and um, ultimately, Emory offered me the job. So I became chair of the department. And my goal was to build an experimental pathology group, which I did, um, with the help of a wonderful young man who's now in Oregon, Mitch Turker, who was my first recruit. And he and I together recruited some basic scientists. And that was how I learned that Recruiting basic scientists is very different from recruiting pathologists, um, MD pathologists, because with MD pathologists, they come in, they give a talk, they wear a jacket and tie if they're male, or they dress up if they're female, and they give this talk, and you take them out to a nice dinner, and you um, have people go, and it's very social. With PhDs, they come in, they reluctantly wear a jacket, and usually a tie, often with a plaid shirt, um, and corduroys, and as soon as the talk is over, they change into their jeans, and the jacket goes away, the tie goes away, and when you take them out to dinner, they want to talk science, and so you need to bring a group of scientists. And so we, we recruited a wonderful group of young PhD faculty, and it was, it was a great time. I was chair for 10 years, and it was, we really built the department based on what Abner had done and building it, and, got a, a wonderful group of, of dynamic faculty and really were well integrated into the university. And by then, Tad and I had two more children, my younger two sons, and we were very happy there. However, after 10 years, I realized that the dean was not going to give me any more resources for the department. I had looked at a chairmanship at Wisconsin and almost gone to the University of Wisconsin to be chair of pathology and decided not to go. But, you know, the, we were sort of at that point on our own. We, we were doing well with the practice plan and we had lived through some hard times because Back in the early 80s, pathology reimbursements changed, and we, we really weathered that storm. Um, but I knew that I wasn't going to get more recruitment resources from the dean, and I thought it's probably time to look for something else. My husband wanted to stay in Kentucky, but I thought if I, if I look for another chairmanship at someplace else, if I try to become chair of pathology at another institution, what kind of a message am I sending to this group of faculty? Because for me, they were the best. There wasn't anybody better. And so I decided, what would it be like to be a dean? Maybe I'll look at a few dean's positions because my passion is medical education. I love the whole concept of medical education, but I think we could do it better. And I think I might be able to do something like that if I became a dean. But I'm not going to go someplace where I don't want to live. And so I looked around and I thought, eh, where? And the dean's position at Kansas, the University of Kansas, was open. And I didn't know anything about Kansas City. Uh, but the um, new chancellor at the University of Kansas in Lawrence had been the, um, the equivalent of the provost um, at Kentucky. He was Bob Hemingway, and he was sort of the second in command. It's not called a provost at Kentucky at that time, but it was called a, a vice president, and so he was the vice president. So I knew him. Um, so I decided I would 
sort of on a whim look at this position and so I interviewed for the deanship and um, they asked me to come. It was a shock. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> now, so I, I decided, yes, we should go to Kansas. We liked the city. Kansas City was a well-kept secret. But my two younger sons, my, my daughter was then um, through college and in vet school. My oldest son was um, in medical school and my two younger sons were in high school. So it was hard to think about moving kids in high school, especially my second son who was going into his senior year. And so we gave him the choice of staying in Kentucky or moving with us and he decided to come to Kansas. So. The two boys and Tad moved in July, and I moved three months before in April out and um, started a whole new career as a dean and realized that being a dean was very different from being a department chair. Um, you had to recruit department chairs, and instead of working in a discipline you knew very well, you were working um, across a whole medical school. And there were two campuses at Kansas. They had a, another medical school in Wichita. It was for the third and fourth years, unlike Duluth here, which is for the first and second years. But there was a, a community campus, so I had to travel down to Duluth. And, but the students were the students, and they were wonderful, and there were lots of things that I could do. And um, I, I really enjoyed our time there. We were there for five years. When I went to Kansas, friends of mine at the AAMC in Washington said, don't go there, Debbie. Kansas eats up deans. And no dean had stayed at the University of Kansas Medical School for longer than three years. And most of them had left within a year and a half. I stayed for five and I was very proud of that and I was really proud of some of the things we did. Um, they didn't have a white coat ceremony and so I wanted the students to feel really engaged in their medical school and to feel that there was some kind of ceremony that welcomed, welcomed them into the profession of medicine. So we started our first white coat ceremony and it took a year to get it planned and everything but it was so wonderful because most of the students in Kansas, like Kentucky, both state medical schools, most of the students came from Kansas. A lot of them came from western Kansas, very rural. Um, and I still remember walking down one of the corridors after the ceremony, and these students had brought their families, and it was a big gala occasion, and we put their little white coats on all of them. And I saw this young woman in a short white coat with a very tall, sort of um, weathered looking man standing next to her. And he stopped me and said, I just want to tell you that was, that was a too hanky experience. And it was her grandfather. And her grandfather had come from western Kansas to see her and the white coat ceremony, and it was obviously so wonderfully emotional for all of them. When I went to Kansas from Kentucky, um, people at Kentucky said, well, at least you're going to a basketball state. And the chancellor, when he asked me to come, said, I know what I'm going to have to do for you, Debbie. I'm going to have to get some hundred-year-old alumnus to give up his seat so you get basketball tickets in, in Allen Fieldhouse, and I said, yes, you will. And so we got two seats um, in Allen Fieldhouse, which is very tiny. In Lexington, we had regular seats at the University of Kentucky games in Rep Arena. So we became huge college basketball fans, and um, it's not stopped till this day. So Kansas was wonderful. We had great times. Um, the boys did well in school. Josh went off to college and then Nate went off to college. I recruited a lot of department chairmen, um, really built up the professional initi professionalism initiatives for the students, um, and was very much enjoying myself. Um, and wasn't really thinking about looking at other medical schools, but other places were calling me and asking me to look at their different jobs. And the first one I looked at was Ohio State. My daughter had gone to vet school there in Columbus, and I really wasn't going to go, but they um, kept bugging me, um, come and interview, come and interview, and so I did. And I decided Ohio State's not for me. 
I looked at the University of Vermont because my mother was still alive at that time, living by herself and elderly in New Hampshire, and it was just a couple of hours down from Burlington. And I realized that, no, this would not be a good move. Um, but then I was asked to look at the University of Minnesota. And my son, my oldest son, Adam, um, had gone to medical school here, had done his residency in neurology here, and was a young neurologist at the time. His little son, my grandson and wife, were here. So I decided that I would come and look. And the other thing about Minnesota, which I knew very little about, except that it was a very large university and a very distinguished university. And I knew some people here. I actually knew Dr. Furt. We had been pathology chairs together, so I knew him. And I knew a few other faculty, not many. But I hadn't really thought about coming. It was just, you know, well, there was family here. And so I came up and met with the search committee. And then they asked me back for a visit. And then Dr. Sarah asked me if I would take the job. And all of a sudden, I thought, wow. This is, this is a major research university. This would be really exciting. This would be a great opportunity. So uh, by that time we had no children at home, so it was easier, we didn't have to think about schools. Um, but we had plenty of children who came to visit, so we had to think about houses. So we, we moved in October in 2002 up to Minnesota. And the day we moved in, it snowed. <laughs> But it was just a little sprinkling of snow, so it was fine, no problem. And that was a funny year in Minnesota because I still remember people coming into my office in December. There had been no snow after that little sprinkling in October and saying, we're so sorry you're not having a Minnesota winter. This is terrible. We, we really apologize. This is not typical Minnesota. And I said, no, it's fine, really, <laughs> I don't mind. And then um, in late January, there was a snowstorm, but it was the first one of the winter. And it wasn't bad, even by our New England standards, it was about seven inches of snow. But I said to my husband, you remember we had been living in Kentucky for 20 years, and we had been living in Kansas for five years, we better leave really early in the morning to get to work. So we get out on 394 and it's bare. <laughs> it's not even, not even packed snow, it's bare. <laughs> I thought, I am in a different place, a <laughs> totally different place. So um, I, I had a wonderful seven years as dean at the University of Minnesota. And um, it was great to be in a city with my oldest son, even though he and his wife were incredibly busy and I didn't see them often. But it was nice to be able to have them for Thanksgiving and spend Christmases together and, and that was a wonderful side benefit. I realized what a great state this was. I mean, I'd never been in a state that was so outdoors oriented and with such a, a huge a number of things to do, theater and sports, and it was really exciting. So recruiting, which I thought would be extremely hard, was much easier than I expected. And I'm very proud of the department heads we recruited here. Almost all of the surgery department heads, um, pediatrics twice, um, radiology. It was, it was a wonderful time to recruit center directors and department chairs. And it was a, a wonderful institution to recruit to because I think we were able to build up strong research programs and um, really make a difference in the medical school, which the new dean is going to be able to build upon. And that's a great opportunity, I think, for someone. It's a fantastic place. I spent a lot of time in 2009, 2010, just um, being on the board of the AAMC and um, being involved with being the immediate, the chair elect, and then the chair, and then the immediate past chair, it took a lot of my time. It was a newly constituted board, so it was an exciting time to be involved with that. But um, I kept thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I won't have any, all of these 7 a.m. meetings, but um, I've got to get a dog, so I got a puppy. Um, Lucy, who's now my four-year-old golden retriever, so that was wonderful, and I'm sure she's very angry at me because I thought I would have all this time to spend with a dog, and I don't have as much time as I thought I would to spend with a dog. And at that time, um, I rejoined the pathology department, of course, 
And um, I'd been away from pathology for quite a while, um, being dean at two places. And while I knew some of the faculty in pathology, I didn't know everybody. But I thought maybe I can help teaching. But the person who'd been the course director, Alan Rose, um, was very sick and then subsequently died of pancreatic cancer, a huge tragedy. And Alan had laid the groundwork for a, a medical school course. So I sort of was available and stepped in to sort of take over the faculty role of coordinating the course. Um, and very soon after that, the medical school moved to the format of the human disease blocks in the second year. So I correlated the pathology with the human disease blocks in the second year and ran the first year course. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's been um, not totally fun because I still hate writing exam questions, but it's been um, really enjoyable to be able to start to put your own stamp on the educational programs for the medical students. And so I have very much enjoyed that. I've enjoyed reconnecting with pathology and um, helping to try to recruit um, new faculty to the department and um, watching the astounding pathologists that are in the department and helping to interview new residents. And so that's been a lot of fun to sort of going back to my roots as a pathologist. Um, the other thing that I've been doing though, which is really satisfying for me, is that I've been involved in medical education at a very different level. Um, years ago, probably uh, six or seven years ago, I started talking with friends of mine at different organizations, and I've been involved with a huge number of organizations in organized medicine in this country, um, about ways that we could teach medical students differently. And one of my closest friends, Carol Caraccio, who was a faculty member then at the University of Maryland as a pediatrician, and we met at a number of meetings, and we started to talk about our interest in medical education and what we would really love to do. So from talking with Carol and thinking about it, I devised a sort of an um, idea of training differently in medical education and putting medical school and residency together and moving students through based on their own achievements of different levels of competence in the different areas of medical education. Um, and so that they were no longer in necessarily a four-year track, but they could go through maybe in three years or three and a half years, go through at their own rate, their own progress. We'd sort of laid the groundwork for that when I was dean here because I was appalled at the high tuition and um, decided we had to do something about that. So we established the flexible MD. We established two things. One was the flexible MD, one was the dean's scholarships, um, which were full tuition scholarships. But the flexible MD was basically, we would charge students for 11 semesters of tuition, but they could take up to six years to go through medical school. They could decelerate, they could do global rotations, they could go through in the standard four years, but they could, they could go through somewhat at their own pace. So we established that. So I decided that now that I have time, maybe I will try to explore whether we could do this new pathway. But that required a lot of buy-in from all the regulatory agencies in medicine. But I had been on the board of the ACGME. I had been chairman of the board of the AAMC. I had been very connected with the American Board of Medical Specialties because I was on the American Board of Pathology for 12 years and president of that. So I had connections with all of these things. And my friend Carol Caraccio was going at that point to the American Board of Pediatrics. So I said, what if we did this in pediatrics? And I asked the AAMC, would you convene a meeting? So they did. So we convened a meeting in Washington. We had people from the ACGME and the AAMC, and we had people from the American Board of Pediatrics, and friends and colleagues of mine, sort of an eclectic mix. And I outlined this idea, what if we developed a training pathway from pediatricians? And we started 
in the second year of medical school and we track them. They do everything, but they do it from the lens of someone who is going to be a pediatrician. So when they were doing adult medicine, they would be thinking about, my patients are going to grow up to be adults. How can I modify their behavior, their health habits as children to prevent some of these diseases that I see in adults? How can we do this differently? So we've been working on this for three years. There are four medical schools, the University of Minnesota, the University of California, San Francisco, the University of Colorado, the University of Utah. I've recruited all of those schools because their deans were all friends of mine and we got them all together. And this summer at all those four schools, we will enroll our first students in EPAC. Um, and it's going to be a very small pilot program, five students a year. They'll enter the track in their second year. Every one of those schools has promised residency positions for, their, for these students. And we'll see how it goes. It's a great experiment in a new way to educate medical students. It just happens to be pediatrics because the American Board of Pediatrics agreed to do that with us. It could very well be surgery. It could very well be family medicine. And I hope it will lead not to this being the only pathway, but to people doing brave experiments with medical education, maybe tracking students sooner. I can already see how you could do this with pathology or radiology. So it's been, that's been enormously satisfying for me and a lot of fun. And um, it's been it's going to be wonderful to see how this evolves over the next few years. Each one of the four medical schools has agreed to take four classes of students. So when this gets done, we will have about 75 to 80 students going through this way with the matched control students who didn't use this pathway but went into pediatrics. And we'll see what happens. Um, and so that's been keeping me very busy that and being on a lot of committees and being asked to do a lot of things and um, that I never thought I would do, I'm beginning to think maybe I should cut back a little, plus writing exams for medical students here and trying to stay connected with things that I can do in the medical school to help Minnesota. So it's been fun and it's been busy. I'm a native Minnesotan, born in St. Cloud during World War II. Uh, that's where my mother's from, and uh, grew up with with a very wonderful group of women. My mother, her sisters, her mother, my grandmother, whom I just barely remember, and a couple of wonderful, wonderful cousins. And they all took care of me until I was two plus, and then uh, we moved to uh, Minneapolis, and then I grew up from there, and, uh, and then went, went to Harvard for college. And then during college, I decided I wanted to go to med school, and then that was the decision to come, come to the university. And, and then my first year of medical school was actually, a, for me, a bit on the boring side. And so I, then I learned about the MD-PhD program and uh, enrolled in that and uh, then went on. And so I started uh, medical school in 1965 and I graduated with my MD and PhD in 1970. And, uh, and the PhD was in anatomy. Basically I did research in cell biology on uh, insulin production and secretion. And that was a terrific experience, uh, being a graduate student and a medical student at the university. And then sometime in med school, I discovered laboratory medicine. And when I did, that was my clear-cut decision as to what I wanted to do for residency. It would allow me to do research, teaching, and some patient care, but I did not want to do direct patient care. And this allowed me to stay close, but not not uh, on top of patient care, which is something that I have great admiration and respect for those who do it and how they do patient care 
at the same time they do research and teach is just amazing to me. But I don't do that. I haven't done that. And I've been a happy uh, denizen of lab medicine and pathology since on the faculty since 1974. I did a one-year sabbatical with colleagues in diabetes in, uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, and that was a terrific year being away and uh, just having that experience to live somewhere else, to be an American at the time of the Afghanistan invasion by Russia and to be there. Um, actually, I was there when St. Helens blasted, and so I saw a lot of things from the distance living in, uh, in Northern Europe. That was a great experience, special experience. Research was wonderful. And so I, I, I entered, it kind of was a continuation of my PhD work, working on uh, di diabetes from the point of view of insulin secretion and production. And then sometime about 1980, 82, 83, I had a chance to apply to be the central laboratory for what was called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. And we in lab medicine were naturals to be the central lab, although we hadn't done it before, because we had this lab experience. We knew the, we knew the clinical medicine. We knew diabetes. And so I, I applied for it, and I got it. And then that started in 1984, 85. Excuse me, it might even be 83. But since then, we've been the lab for that trial and then its follow-up study. So basically, when we started, Gene Buxom, my very close friend and colleague who was our lab manager for a long time, she retired about two years ago. And uh, I, we, uh, we always said, well, we'd, uh, we'd retire on DCCT. And now then we said, well, as it went on, we said, we'll die on DCCT. <laughs> Haven't quite done that yet, but we've, uh, she retired on it, and I'm in a phased on retirement, still involved in it, and I'll be involved in it at least until I retire. And this has been a great experience, wonderful thing from a scholarship point of view. So, so we get samples, and we, the lab, we now have probably six to 10 faculty who are involved, and then we have about 30 uh, technicians, technologists who do the work. And uh, we actually are, are fairly big and we're moving now. We're, we've been in this old lab in the Mayo building and now we're moving to a new facility in the old supercomputer building at West Bank. So that's a real neat deal and uh, we'll continue to do it. And uh, it's been a wonderful source of uh, scholarship and satisfaction for that matter for a group of faculty and a group of technologists. And uh, satisfaction being we, we can do research, we can ask interesting questions in people with our colleagues, but also satisfaction because this trial demonstrated absolutely conclusively that optimal management of diabetes prevented the complications of diabetes. So people who have diabetes and are able to treat themselves in an optimal way have greatly diminished their chances of getting the complications, eye disease, kidney disease, and even probably cardiovascular disease, although the latter is not quite so strong. So that's what, that's what we've done for all these years. I had the great benefit of having David Brown, Dave Brown, who later became the dean, be a wonderful mentor, and he brought me into pediatric endocrinology. So here I was, this laboratory medicine resident, and I started attending pediatric endocrinology clinic and went on rounds with them. And uh, it was an incredibly good experience. So I learned to take care of pediatric endocrine diseases and uh, thyroid, diabetes, pituitary disease. And uh, Dave was there to mentor me. And then there's a, I think he's recently, passed away, incredible clinician named Bob Alstrom, who uh, really, uh, watching him handle children as a clinician was just an incredible experience, and just being there to learn how to do clinical medicine through them. And by the way, if I were going to be a real clinician, it would be pediatric endocrinology. Uh, 
internal medicine people look askance at that, but I'd rather deal with the children than the adults. Not that I don't like adults, but the children are really fast. There's nothing zanier than a teenage girl uh, in terms of what she is, is trying to accomplish as a patient with a variety of different endocrine diseases. So that was fun. But then at some time in there, a couple of the moms wanted me to be their pediatrician. And I said, no, I can't do that. Because I didn't know, I knew pediatric endocrine somewhat, but I did not know pediatrics. So then I decided, okay, I've got to get out of this. By that time, I was a faculty member in lab medicine, and then went over and just did lab medicine. Ran the endocrine lab in lab medicine, started it, ran it, and, uh, and then uh, did uh, clinical laboratory, director of clinical laboratories, and now in the last 10 years I've phased into almost total research, which has been wonderful because that's, I've been able to fund myself pretty well on that, and uh, we've got a really good national reputation f as, as the kind of lab we are. So we can apply for uh, projects, we can apply for funding, but also uh, sometimes people come to us and say, hey, we got something that we'd like to do and we need a, a clinical, a central lab, and we're the central lab, and we can do that and do it well. And we do, we do routine work extremely well, and we do uh, esoteric work very well, and we accomplish all of this with great efficiency and dispatch, and that's, that's kind of the hallmark of what we do. It's a great uh, delivery of uh, assay results to a variety of clinical trials and studies, all funded by uh, National Institutes of Health. And so we get, uh, we get lots, and, and I've just recently went from maybe 10, 15 studies, trials, a couple of them ended and a couple I needed to give up, or a few more I needed to give up, and now I'm down to about five or six. And that's nice as I, as I phase down. So I've got about 50% time and the nice thing about this is now is I've got younger colleagues who are actually, you know, old enough to be, or young enough to be my children age-wise, who are really smart and push me to get a lot of things done. So that's been a really special thing. And I, I can't say I'm mentoring them. They might think I am, but I'm just simply being a, as good a colleague as I can to them and just always trying to catch up with them. So that's been a great experience. Teaching has been a uh, really interesting thing where I uh, organized and directed the uh, endocrine uh, section of the uh, second year of med school for a number of years. And then of late, uh, until I started phasing out, I've been the, uh, the only non-clinician doing small groups with that, with that. And that was really fun because I, uh, enjoyed the challenges of dealing with second year med students and, uh, and knew enough clinical medicine and knew enough basic endocrinology to be able to focus them on the, it, that's the second year is basically case driven basic information for the med students. And that's, and as I say, I was really very proud to be the only non-clinician doing that. And now I'm out of it and actually don't do much teaching now at all. And, uh, Okay, other things I do, um, I'm a bird watcher, and um, I travel for that, and um, I have a, a life goal to see as many representatives of bird families, which is kind of intermediate level from a phylogenetic point of view, as I can. And so um, that quest takes me to many other parts of the world. And that's been fun because occasionally I can combine my hobby with, uh, with my, uh, my work. So I, last year I had a meeting in, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and I secured a wonderful guide and went bird watching in, in Malaysia and saw about five or six new families to me, plus a whole lot of other interesting creatures. It was a very special experience. And uh, that may uh, 
That may be kind of the uh, last time I took a trip related to work and to my to that hobby. And uh, but I've got some I got some trips planned in the future. Madagascar later this year and Borneo, part of Malaysia next year. And uh, it takes me to strange places, but you know. You go to these strange places and you meet people who are your guides and they're very smart people and they know an awful lot about local flora and fauna that of course as a visitor you don't know so you learn a lot from from these people and uh, and you see you not only see birds but you you see uh, reptiles and you'll see mammals and uh, other creatures and sometimes literally on you you'll see insects and they bite, and um, so you, you kind of deal with that. You, deal, you do deal with that, and, um, but the, uh, the overall uh, experience is you go into a place and you learn about what the place is like. I mean, not that distant from here are Central and South America, and so I've, I've been down there. Again, there are a lot of different creatures there, and uh, and there, I mean, I was in Brazil a few years ago and not only saw a lot of interesting, many interesting birds, parrots, hummingbirds, other creatures, and then also saw a jaguar and uh, saw probably anywhere between 500 and 1,000 caiman. You know, they're like our alligators, but they're, they're a different species. But the most amazing species down there was a, was a river otter. You know, we have otters in Minnesota, but these otters in, um, in tropical America are uh, two meters long. So you've got six, you've got six feet of otter. And they are, they're in the uh, streams, and I was in Peru recently, and there, there were otters in the lake where I was at. Special creatures. And they've got, they've got a head about the size of a dish plate, and they'll take a uh, they'll take a big fish, say originally this long, and then they'll eat it. And uh, none of the small fish for them; they eat the big ones. So that's been that's been a plus. I mean, you know, I go there with a focus on the birds, and have great guides to to find the unusual birds I want to see. But then also at, in both Brazil and in Peru, they showed me these incredible otters. That was, that was really neat. And um, now, of course, you go to Africa, and if we, and my uh, focus there has been, again, target bird families. But then you also see the mammals, and the uh, most amazing species I saw in Africa was a giraffe. And a giraffe in itself, as tall as it is, is an ecosystem un unto itself. There are birds that live just on the giraffe, and uh, basically get a meal. They're called uh, oxpeckers. And they're, a, a, they're an unusual bird family all unto themselves. And they eat the insects that are on the giraffes. And you can see them climbing up and down the necks of the giraffes. Very special experience. And so you can, you can see all those creatures. And uh, I could go, I'm not going to go on and on. Okay, other hobby I have is um, I'm not a musician but I'm kind of an opera nut. So I, I go to opera, and I've gone to opera in different parts of the world, and um, most seasons I make a pilgrimage to, to New York to see the opera at the Metropolitan Opera. And um, that's been an interesting hobby, sidelight, something to focus me intellectually in addition to, to the uh, birds and in addition to my work. You know, it's, it's such a privilege to be a faculty member. And our, uh, I don't think, I know the uh, politicians in the Midwestern states, say Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, do not understand the jewels they have with their state universities and um, how accomplished and how, I mean, how broad our university, I mean, with both the Minneapolis and St. Paul campuses, our university is just unbelievably uh, diverse in terms of the, uh, of the academic pursuits. And you know, you're always learning and you can always walk across the street and keep run into someone or catch up with someone who 
really knows a lot about something you don't know and, uh, and something that you can, from which you can learn. And that's been a lifetime of that kind of thing. Special, and it's great to have a med school immersed in a first class research university. In many places, the med schools are separate, but not here, it's, it's integral to the university and that's very, very nice. Being the central lab of the diabetes control and complications trial and its uh, follow-up study, epidemiology of diabetes complications and interventions. Some people say it's the best clinical trial ever done and we were the central lab. And we actually, I'm still involved avidly to keep a special lab test on target all the way from the beginning of that trial in 1983 until now, 30 years later. And it's, it's called hemoglobin A1C, which is integrated measure of glycemia or glucose in us. And it's glucose attaching to hemoglobin in the red cells. And uh, basically it's an integrated measure of glucose concentrations in a person over the last two to three months. And it represents the uh, integrated life of red cells in us. And uh, it's very hard to keep an assay on target for that period of time. But basically, that assay has anchored that trial and its follow-up study ever since the very beginning. And I'm still involved in really defining, uh, ascertaining with certainty that, that we are still on target with regard to the results we report for that assay. Now, the, my colleagues in the, in the study say, well, you know, we're not worried about that, Mike. You know, you, we'll make sure that, you know, we know you can keep it on target. Yeah, but I gotta be sure I do keep it on target. And that's, being part of that and being, uh, being the lab for that is the thing I regard most strongly. And other than that, we've been involved in a lot of other trials and they've all been exciting and other studies and, um, all NIH sponsored, and that's been a terrific experience. I would like my legacy to be terrific central laboratory accomplishments for National Institutes of Health sponsored clinical trials and clinical studies. And basically the transition has been made. There's now a new leadership in charge of this whole uh, activity. And there are new leadership both at the faculty level, Tony Colleen, and, and wonderful new leadership at the uh, technologist level, Jennifer Peters and uh, Bob Janicek. So we've made the transition to a younger generation and, uh, um, and that's, that's wonderful to know that we'll continue on and uh, be uh, highly competitive in terms of getting the work. And we have to be competitive both in terms of how well we do the assays and also we need to be competitive in terms of of costs, and, uh, and we've done this at the University of Minnesota for 30 years now, and I see us continuing to do it at least for another 10 years, and hopefully f for much longer than that. But you know, research studies are funded, and there's an evolution, and, and things can die out, and so it, I just feel that central laboratory work for a clinical trial or study funded by our National Institutes of Health will be a necessary function going out for decades. And whether we do what we're doing now, I don't think we necessarily will. There are new technologies that will be implemented that are just either in a very uh, challenging stage now, but over the horizon, they'll be much more uh, readily applicable. And, uh, We've set the stage for that, and we will continue to do that. Yeah. Well, well, what I really want to, I feel strongly that it's been a privilege to be on the faculty of a great university. And that's been true for my whole career. Yes, there have been challenges. Yes, there are. And you've always got to uh, compete for funding, and that's sometimes a bit uh, pressured and a bit stressful. But that's been my I'm very, very thankful to, to have that opportunity and to remain on the faculty as, as a phase down and phase out. And that's been a privilege and it's been a s source of a feeling of accomplishment and, uh, and a great feeling of community, both locally 
and, and nationally and then also internationally, to be in a research community, all trying to do something as well as you can. And we have a special niche in uh, laboratory medicine because we are really good at keeping assays on target and keeping them performing well. And that's what we've done and that's what we will continue to do under our new leadership and direction. And it's nice to know that I can uh, come to work working with new leaders who are uh, taking us upwards and beyond. I was born in Boston, but grew up in Ohio. I thought it was too cold in Ohio, and I've ended up in Minnesota for 40-some years. So something is wrong here somewhere. Although it's not wrong at all because it's been a wonderful, wonderful run here. Uh, I went to uh, college at Northwestern and thought Chicago and the lakefront was too cold also. So here I am even more in Minnesota. Um, and then back to Ohio to medical school at Ohio State. Uh, it was touch and go because uh, actually my first year of medical school I absolutely hated it and I seriously considered dropping out but I thought I was so fortunate to have gotten in that it would have been stupid to drop out so I would stay with it and see how things went from there. So uh, uh, from there I went to uh, Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee as an intern in internal medicine uh, and that was an experience also because this is a long time ago. That was in the 60s. And things were still uh, uh, pretty uh, not terribly open-minded in the Deep South then. Not necessarily even more so now, but um, when I um, got to Vanderbilt University Hospital, for instance, uh, there were two drinking fountains, one labeled colored and one labeled white. Uh, there were four bathrooms, colored women, colored men, white men, white women. Um, and uh, there were many of us in my internship group were from the north. So we kind of integrated the hospital and that one of the things that we would sometimes find is when we were on call at night and we wanted to admit a patient, we'd sometimes be told there wasn't a bed. Later on, we would find that there were empty beds and the problem was their empty bed didn't match the race of the person that we wanted to admit. So once we figured this out, we started just taking the patients up and putting them in bed ourselves. And then going the next morning and telling the admissions office that there was a patient up there in some bed. Uh, but it was a fantastic experience, just incredible. Uh, the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the time was a guy named David Rogers. Uh, he's the son of a famous psychologist named Carl Rogers. So David was an, uh, just a wonderful guy. And uh, in those days, um, things were not nearly as well developed as they are now. So for instance, the clinical labs closed at eight o'clock at night. So if we wanted a CBC, uh, uh, we had to do it ourselves on new admissions. Uh, we had to do spinal taps and take the spinal fluid to the lab and look at it ourselves. Uh, if we wanted to inoculate cultures, we went to the micro lab and inoculated the cultures. Uh, and also doing EKGs, uh, any of that sort of thing, we, we did it ourselves. Um, it was an interesting place though because we did have some country western stars who were admitted to Vanderbilt. Uh, one of my patients was a guy named Earl Scruggs. There's a combination flat and Scruggs, and I forgot one of them played the guitar and one of them played the banjo, but they were very well known, and Earl Scruggs was admitted for headaches. Uh, there were other, other big names were in and out of the hospital. Uh, uh, June Carter Cash was there. Uh, Brenda Lee had a baby there. Uh, so it was really interesting from that standpoint. Um, and at that time, Nashville was dry. You couldn't buy alcohol. Uh, so if you went out to dinner, you could buy a, you could take your own bottle of alcohol and buy a mixed setup. On the other hand, we didn't have a lot of time to go out to dinner anyway. And that, those days, internships, uh, my internship, I was on every other night for six months out of the 12. And that meant we would go into the hospital around seven or eight in the morning. You'd work all day, all that night, all the next day, but you never got out of the hospital by five in the afternoon. You usually get out maybe eight o'clock the following evening. 
So it was, uh, on the other hand, uh, the patient experiences were unbelievable. Um, some of them still choke me up, and I remember very clearly. Uh, one of my patients um, was a man in his probably early 40s who developed acute renal failure, and he, we had to put him on dialysis. And it, uh, kidney transplants were a, a big deal in those days, and they still are, but they weren't very readily available, and we weren't sure that he was going to survive long enough to get a kidney transplant. The guy had two little girls. They were about six and eight. And in those days, <clears throat> the visiting rules were very rigid. He was in the VA hospital, and he, his girls weren't allowed to come up and see him. So his mother and I conspired, and I snuck the girls up the back stairway so they could go in and see their dad. Um, I happened to go back to Vanderbilt about eight or nine years later and learned that the guy had gotten a kidney transplant and was doing well. But it was, you know, he got to see his girls when we didn't know how long he was going to survive. Um, I think my la the last new patient I had there, I, I was back there for a second year, so I had two years of internal medicine at Vanderbilt, and I think the last new patient that I admitted was a woman, probably late 30s, who had new acute myelogenous leukemia. And uh, that was about 1970. And the chemotherapeutics really weren't all that good then. And so she also had a couple of younger children. I don't remember how old. She was dead in six weeks. So it was um, quite an experience uh, <clears throat> in um, dealing with the kinds of really human issues that you experience in clinical medicine. One more little vignette uh, for this. Um, one of my other patients um, was a man, probably 60-ish, who had carcinoma of the pancreas. And he was a, a end stage. Uh, and I think he had, <clears throat> I don't know where his wife was. I don't remember her being in the picture, but he had one child who was a daughter who was about 30. And I uh, remember the last night of this man's life, I would, happened to be on all, all night, and I basically sat there with his daughter uh, all night while he was dying. Um, those kinds of things set your career in a particular pathway, I guess, or they certainly, maybe not a particular pathway to your career, but um, they sure affect how you think about medicine and how you think about patients. So uh, how in the world did I ever end up in Minnesota when it was too cold everywhere else? <clears throat> that was uh, the time of my internal medicine residency was also the Vietnam War, and I knew I was about to be drafted, so I volunteered for the public health service. I did get drafted, ended up going to Memphis to have a physical and everything else, but I had already volunteered for the public health service. And um, at that time, I thought I wanted to do infectious disease. And so when I volunteered, they said we could discuss what I would do, and uh, they would try to make that uh, arrangement. So what we had agreed on is I was supposed to go to Trinidad to work on a cholera vaccine for the CDC. So my orders come through from the public health service, and it says report to the state health department in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So I called them up and I said, you know, what is this? I thought I was going to Trinidad. What is Minneapolis? And they said, well, sometimes things just don't work out the way we hope. I said, so, you know, you volunteered for the public health service and you, can, you don't have to go. You can always resign. Well, I'd already been drafted. So I thought, well, it's either Minneapolis or Vietnam, so I'll opt for Minneapolis. Uh, so I was here assigned to the state health department for three years in the public health service. During that time, of course, I started to spend time around the university hospital and particularly got to know uh, Bill Crivet, who was a pediatric hematologist. Um, and we began to collaborate on some projects. You know, Bill was always ready to get any kind of free help that he could get uh, to develop some projects. So we started to look at uh, leukemia, the distribution of leukemia deaths th throughout the state of Minnesota, looking to see whether there might be clusters or some things like that. And uh, the other thing that was uh, active at the time is um, 
uh, the development of tumor registries in hospitals around the state. And the state health department had a program to help hospitals establish tumor registries. And so I was put in charge of that as well. So actually, it was really kind of, um, I don't know if fun is the right word. It was kind of a fun time because I got to know the state of Minnesota probably better than most natives because of the state health department. I really traveled all over the state, up on the Iron Range and up to the northwestern part of the state and down to the, uh, the southwestern part. And uh, you know, I really developed a feel for the state of Minnesota and the small hospitals and communities and things that, uh, that make up this wonderful state. Um, and also then during this time when I was spending more time around the uh, university, uh, became aware of the program in laboratory medicine or clinical pathology, which at that time was one of the few in the United States. And I decided that I would prefer to make my base in the laboratory rather than to go and have one more year in clinical medicine. So I uh, then arranged to enter the um, laboratory medicine residency when I finished the public health service. Um, another reason that it ended up doing that here, at that time there were only three places in the United States that you could do clinical pathology without having to do two years of anatomic pathology, which I had absolutely no interest in doing. Uh, it was University of Minnesota, uh, Yale, and University of California, San Francisco. So I thought, I'm already here, and I like the people, so I stayed. And essentially been in the department ever since. Um, I finished my uh, last year of residency in July of 1970, and that was at Vanderbilt. And came back here, and I've been on the staff and the, in the department ever since. Uh, during all that time, I've been um, away from Minnesota a total of, I guess, three and a half years. Uh, I was on sabbatical for a year at the NIH, and then I um, uh, took a two-year, about maybe two and a half-year leave of absence, where I was in, during which time I was in Washington, D.C., serving as the um, Senior Vice President for Biomedical Services for the Red, American Red Cross. Essentially, that meant that I had overall responsibility for their national blood program, which at the time was about half of the blood in the United States. We were collecting about six million units of blood a year. Um, nationally, about 13,000 employees and a budget of $900 million. The reason they had me out there was uh, <clears throat> Red Cross had gotten into some really tense times with the FDA and regulatory problems beginning with the uh, HIV epidemic. And of course, that's another chapter in, in the whole story of most people in medicine, but uh, the way it affected all of us in transfusion medicine, of course, was issues about uh, transfusion transmitted HIV and the safety of the blood supply. Um, um, the other thing that's been unique about my career is up until about 10 years ago, uh, so for about 30 years, I not only was the medical director of the University Hospital Blood Bank, but also medical director of the uh, Red Cross Regional Blood Center in St. Paul. Um, and in later years, I was essentially the CEO of that blood center. Um, that wasn't, not very many people did that. It w wasn't really common around the United States because you've got, you're the CEO of your supplier and then you're the CEO, you're the medical director of the hospital blood bank. And so there always were some questions about whether there was a conflict there or whether the Red Cross would give preferential treatment to the university uh, because I would be sure that happened. Actually, I thought of it just the opposite. I thought that um, if we could be sure that we always met the university's needs, we could handle anything anyplace else in the state. Uh, so um, it, it had a lot of professional advantages though because it enabled us to have a kind of a comprehensive program. You could look at what sorts of things made sense to do in a community operation uh, uh, versus what sort of things made sense to do in a highly technical medical uh, facility. 
and then you could put all that package together so it enables us to have just about anything uh, in the spectrum of activities in transfusion medicine. The other thing in the early stages of my career, it was a time when technology was just being developed uh, to, uh, to uh, create instruments that uh, would pump blood out of the blood donor and into a device that would separate the blood into its different components. And you could then keep, salve, save whichever of those components you wanted, recombine the rest of the blood and return it to the donor. So you'd have a co continuous cycle of blood and it enabled you to collect a large number of cells of certain types, more than you would be able to collect in an ordinary pint of blood as it's donated. Um, this was just in its infancy, and these instruments were brand new. Uh, nobody knew what the, the adverse events were going to be with the donors, how to manage anticoagulation, all that sort of thing, how often you could do it, whether you were going to deplete cells. Uh, so it was one of the things that really um, helped to jumpstart my career because of my two years in internal medicine, I was much more comfortable with donors in a patient kind of setting. When we first started to do this, we did it on an intensive care unit, and we had the donors connected to EKG monitors and all this sort of thing. And so the people in transfusion medicine who came through pathology were very uncomfortable with that and wouldn't do it. So it enabled me to get in on the ground floor of all of apheresis. So I did a lot of advising the FDA about donor standards, and I chaired several federal committees about establishing criteria and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and the other thing that having those blood cell, cell separators enabled us to do was to begin to collect um, concentrates of cells that are in rather low level in ordinary circulating blood, but you could collect enough of these to begin to give transfusions of cells you hadn't been able to give before. The main one of these was granulocytes or neutrophils, uh, a form of white blood cell. Um, those cells are um, key to uh, combating bacterial or fungal infections. And so for the first time, it was possible to consider giving granulocyte or neutrophil transfusions. So again, we were able to be kind of out in front and all that. And we combined that with laboratory work. So we set up methods to test granulocytes in vitro to see if they still function normally after they'd been collected. We were able to set up uh, assays to see how one could store them, that sort of thing. And so I was fortunate then to establish a relationship with people at the, at the U who were experts in granulocyte function, specifically Paul Kui. So he and I wrote several papers together. He taught me how to uh, determine granulocyte function in the laboratory. And uh, uh, he was just a wonderful uh, mentor and, uh, and, and guide during those early years, uh, as Bill Crivet also continued to be. So um, the other thing, um, now we're into the 80s. Um, uh, um, two things, uh, as John Kersey began to really build the bone marrow transplant program here at the U, uh, this put a lot of pressure on the blood bank because those patients required a lot of transfusions. And so uh, we, John and I formed a really nice relationship so that we would be sure that the blood bank had what it needed in order to support his marrow transplant patients and development of his program. Uh, one of the, there were two things specifically that came out of that. The first is bone marrow processing. Uh, many of the first transplant patients were children, so they were small. Uh, in collecting the bone marrow for the transplant, usually the donors were adults, and uh, you would keep collecting marrow, doing cell counts periodically until they had the number of cells that they wanted in order to do the transplant. Often that would result in a very large volume of bone marrow, maybe as much as a liter, whereas you might only be able to give the child a couple of hundred cc's. So we had to manipulate that bone marrow in order to prepare those cells to be uh, uh, transfused. Um, and so what, lo what more logical place to do that than the blood bank? 
we were the only entity in the hospital that was used to manipulating blood to put it into people. So John and I had the agreement that he would do the clinical part of the transplant and we would handle the, the bone marrow. Uh, so we began to, we set up a bone marrow processing laboratory in which we could uh, uh, select the uh, marrow stem cells or manipulate the marrow to make it suitable for um, transplantation. Well, that grew and grew. And today, for instance, it's uh, uh, known, uh, it's over at the molecular and cellular therapy facility on the St. Paul campus. I think there are more technicians working in that cell therapy lab today than there are working in the regular blood bank. It's just exploded. And so now it's not just bone marrow, it's blood stem cells, it's cord blood, it's natural killer cells, it's T regulatory cells. It, it led to this facility that, that is the source of expertise in how to manipulate and how to handle blood cells or other kinds of cells uh, in a way that prepares them for uh, injection into humans. Uh, and all started when John and I said, okay, you deal with the patients, I'll take care of the bone marrow. Um, the other thing that developed then about that time was um, uh, it was very clear that um, only a very small portion <clears throat> of the patients who needed a transplant had a donor. Uh, about that same time, uh, John Hansen, who had been a uh, hematology oncology uh, fellow here with Bob Good, <coughs> was in Seattle, and John carried out a bone marrow transplant uh, uh, between a donor and a patient who were not related. <coughs> Turned out the donor was one of the technicians in the HLA lab out there, and in typing everybody, they learned that she was an identical HLA type with a patient who needed a transplant, so they did it. And it was successful. Uh, it was a young girl with leukemia, and they got, it, they got engraftment and she got a remission. So that established for the first time that you could do a bone marrow transplant using an unre a donor unrelated to the patient. Well, kind of the roof blew off, and um, uh, uh, Bill Crivet uh, entered, entered again being uh, as Bill always was, and I remember very specifically a couple of uh, bone marrow transplant conferences over in the uh, what's now the Cancer Center, uh, where Bill was, uh, <clears throat> I don't mean this as negative as it sounds, Bill was basically attacking me, saying, you've got to find donors for our patients. You're the donor guy, find those donors. Well, we started to look, and this is what, um, is now the National Marrow Donor Program, uh, based here in the Twin Cities, has now a file of about six million donors. And uh, the last I knew a year or so ago, they were approaching 60,000 transplants for which the, whom they've provided donors. We started uh, by approaching donors who had been HLA typed to donate platelets uh, for a couple of reasons. One is they'd already been HLA typed, so we didn't have to find the money to type them. And secondly, they had already proven that they would go a little beyond uh, the usual donation. They had agreed to go on these blood cell separators, which took a couple of hours, and uh, uh, so they were experienced donors. So we decided uh, there was a lot of ethics and all sorts of things to do, but we decided to approach those uh, people to see if they would be willing to donate bone marrow. A lot of people who thought, there's, first of all, there's no way they'll ever agree to it, but even some individuals thought that was not appropriate to even ask them. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, um, we had a guy here at the time who uh, was a nationally very well known and has since gone on to a wonderful career at uh, uh, UPenn. His name is Art Kaplan, and Art was a bioethicist. So we got him involved from the very beginning. The other thing we did is uh, we sponsored a symposium here in the Twin Cities uh, titled something like um, Ethical, Legal, and Practical Issues in the Potential Unrelated Marrow Donors or something like that. So we had attorneys and we had ethicists and then we had hematologists and others and we, we really explored all the different kinds of issues that you'd have to deal with in thinking about whether you wanted to approach people to ask them to donate bone marrow. The reason it was sort of a big deal is at that time they had to undergo general anesthesia in the operating room and the amount of, uh, they might even need a transfusion. 
And, the, and you, uh, of course, there are risks to putting somebody under general anesthesia, so you had to get involved in what sort of medical criteria should be established to try to assure that this is going to be as safe as possible for the donors. And just all kinds of things that had to be done. Um, and this is a place, an example of where this, um, this relationship between the Red Cross Blood Center and the University Hospital was fantastic because these were Red Cross donors. And the Red Cross had the, had the, um, the community support and the image in the community <coughs> to, um, um, to probably open some doors to be able to do this. We had a community board of directors uh, for the Red Cross Blood Center and we went to them with these programs and they were enthusiastic uh, and so we very early on got good community support to do this. Um, so we uh, uh, got a start uh, with the uh, bone marrow donor registry. Uh, it's here uh, we had two Red Cross nurses who started to call donors and ask them if they'd be willing. One of those nurses still works for the uh, National Marrow Donor Program. Uh, uh, she's uh, NMDP employee 002. Uh, so, uh, long story short, obviously it worked. Uh, I remember the first um, transplant that we facilitated through the National Marrow Donor Program, and it's a great example of how the program works. The donor was in Iowa, and the uh, patient, the transplant was done in Milwaukee. And this was in December, and wouldn't you know, there was a snowstorm. And at that time, it wasn't very well known how to preserve bone marrow or how long you could preserve those cells before they would begin to die. So we were under a lot of pressure to get that marrow to Milwaukee as soon as possible. Fortunately, the Civil Air Patrol volunteered and they flew the marrow from uh, Iowa City to uh, Milwaukee. The transplant was successful. It ended up being written up in the Reader's Digest as a human interest story. Well, they've gone on, as I said, to six million donors in the, in the file and uh, 60,000 or more transplants now facilitated all around the world, really. Um, and it's one of the things that I feel most uh, proud of having accomplished. Uh, I was the founding president of the NMDP and it's here because our staff were the first people who were doing it. It, was, it wasn't all me. There were three of us who were partners in founding the National Marrow Donor Program. Uh, John Hansen, the guy that did the first transplant out in Seattle, was also an HLA uh, expert. Uh, and then uh, a, uh, really a gentleman who's an icon in transfusion medicine, his name is Herbert Perkins. He was the um, medical director of the blood center in San Francisco. Uh, and so the three of us were the co-investigators on the original federal contract to establish the NMDP. I was the founding president and uh, it was here because I was responsible to really get it up and running and operate it. So uh, it was not too long after that that, um, that I was asked to go to Washington DC you know, because I'd been involved with the Red Cross in many ways and uh, they were having a lot of problems. Uh, they were making errors, they were erroneously releasing blood that shouldn't have been released. Uh, as far as we know, nobody ever really was uh, infected with hepatitis or, or HIV because of errors that were made, but they were making errors all the time and it was a matter of time till something bad was going to happen. And they knew this and the FDA knew it and the FDA started to uh, pay, uh, put a lot of pressure on the Red Cross. So I was asked to go out and sort of revamp everything. Uh, it was a tumultuous time. I, uh, I got to be the fodder for a 60 Minutes story on the Red Cross. Uh, there was a ton of media attention. I was constantly being interviewed. Uh, there was a congressional hearing where I was the fodder for that. It's rather intimidating to be the one person with your lawyer next to you sitting down there and all the paneling up there with all the congressmen up there ready to fire off questions. Uh, uh, the preparation for that was incredible. And I also, um, uh, was the beneficiary of a lot of uh, media coaching also. My main media coach was a guy named Frank Mankiewicz who prior to that had been the, the uh, director of national public uh, uh, radio. Uh, his, it's either his brother or uncle, um, was, uh, Mankiewicz was the, the uh, director of the movie The Wizard of Oz. So he, he really knew his stuff. 
And one of the, th one of the things I always remember uh, that they taught me was um, uh, don't, don't have your eyes wander around because it makes you look shifty. So look right at the camera or look next to the camera. But we had a lot of, uh, it was a great experience. Um, the number of things that we did uh, that I think um, were fundamentally, uh, were huge changes with the Red Cross and that I think were, were valuable. I'd get, be a little biased if I didn't think that. Um, one is at that time, the Red Cross was doing transmissible disease testing for HIV and hepatitis in about uh, 55 different locations around the United States. Well, to standardize that, to quality control that, and also if you wanted to introduce a new um, improvement in the method, it was almost impossible to do that. So we um, put in place uh, centralized testing. We established, I think, originally 13 national testing laboratories and shut down testing in all the other locations. So you could control it better, you could standardize it better, and you could be more nimble when new tests came out to get them introduced. Um, another huge thing which um, earned me a lot of hostility was um, that we essentially separated the blood program from the other parts of the Red Cross chapter. Uh, before that, blood was one of many different Red Cross pro programs. And so each community that had a Red Cross chapter, there would be a chapter manager, and then they would have a program in first aid or water safety or blood. But what that meant was the ultimate authority over the blood program was the chapter manager. I mean, these, most of these people were wonderful people, but they could barely spell blood. They didn't know anything about blood. Um, and so uh, it didn't provide the kind of leadership that the blood program needed when you're looking at HIV and <clears throat> potentially erroneously releasing an HIV positive unit and all the rest of that sort of thing. So we split it off and therefore we went through a process of uh, people applying to be the new head of each of the regional blood centers. And I had the ultimate authority to make that selection. And of course, I didn't select most of the chapter managers. I selected other people. Many of them were physicians, but many of them were administrators or people who really knew how to run the blood program. Earned me enormous hostility, as, uh, as you can imagine. Um, the other thing that we did, uh, I'd say three things. The other thing that we did is, um, uh, prior to that time, the most blood centers in the United States, including the Red Cross, operated under what I would call a medical um, uh, model, more like a physician dealing with a patient. Uh, so you'd make a lot of individual, individualized decisions based on what the situation warranted. Um, you know, when you're trying to standardize how you process, collect and process six million units of blood a year in 55 locations, you can't do that. Uh, you've got people making different decisions all over the place. Somebody would accept a certain donor in one part of the United States and somebody would reject the same kind of donor in a different part of the United States. You can't do that. So uh, we began to um, introduce uh, what we call the pharmaceutical model, um, meaning that we began to think about operating a blood center the way you would operate if you were Merck making penicillin tablets. You're going to highly structure and standardize everything you do so that if you're Merck and you make penicillin tablets in three different locations around the United States, you do it exactly the same way and your penicillin tablets are all exactly the same no matter where they came from. Um, this was a huge change. Uh, it is what's happened to blood centers over the last 25 or since the HIV epidemic. Um, but again, uh, when you're making changes that are that fundamental, um, you're changing people's way of life, you're changing the kind of people that you need to do different kinds of functions, and it's a tremendous upheaval. So uh, those were, the I'd say, the three key things that we did, um, that, um, that I implemented when I was at Red Cross National Headquarters, um, and I think they've been, I think they've stood the test of time. Um, so the only other thing, maybe a couple other things I would mention. Um, one is I had the wonderful uh, opportunity uh, to serve as the editor of the journal Transfusion for 15 years. Uh, this journal is the world's leading journal in transfusion medicine and blood banking. 
and uh, it was a great experience. I like to think that we made some real uh, enhancements to the journal. Uh, when I took it over, um, it was, um, frankly, I think kind of boring. Um, it was a straightforward black and white journal uh, that came out every two months. Um, took about a year or 15 months to get your article published because of the lag times and everything else. And, and um, the covers were blue and white print, and that was it. Uh, so we did a lot of things with the journal that were actually a lot of fun. We started to put um, uh, graphic designs on the cover. We introduced editorials. We introduced review articles. We introduced commentaries. Uh, and uh, we converted to a monthly publication. And we streamlined the operation so that we could get things in print within six months after they were accepted. Toward the end of my uh, term as editor, we actually were getting things out in about four months after material was uh, sub accepted for publication. Uh, so we did a lot of fun things with the journal. Um, another fun thing we did is I happened to be editor during the year 2000, and so we decided for each of the uh, 12 monthly issues during the year 2000, we would pick, um, the editors and I would select something that we thought was a um, a major advancement in transfusion and, and blood banking over the prior 50 years. And that would be kind of a theme for that issue. And then we would also uh, design a spe special cover graphic and that sort of thing for that, uh, for that issue. And for instance, in the first issue, the whole uh, the theme was blood groups and we recognized the discovery of the ABO blood group system, which was just about 100 years before this. It was in 1902 or something like that. And so we had graphics related to blood groups, but uh, the, it, what it enabled us to do was some fun things. We, we could show how uh, Landsteiner, the Austrian physician who discovered uh, uh, ABO blood groups, basically just took blood from people in his lab and mixed it together and, looked and saw cells clumping. Uh, but by the year 2000, the genes for those blood groups had been cloned, the molecular structure of those antigens was all known, and so we could carry it all the way through that 100 years to show what had happened. So we were able to do that with 11 other themes during that year. And one of the fun things was about it, at the end of the year, what we, uh, I had made up for the associate editors, uh, and I have it in my office, it's one of my favorite things, we made a, a poster with the, the heading on the poster being the, the logo of the journal. But then uh, there was uh, each of the 12 covers uh, was in this poster. And so at our annual uh, editor's meeting, uh, we all signed these posters for each other. And so I have this autographed uh, poster in my office from uh, uh, all the other associate editors that we, who went through all this with me. So I, uh, it's, it's really, it was a, I think we really energized that journal. Um, the other thing that's been a wonderful part of uh, experience here is we've had a blood bank fellowship program. Our first blood bank fellow was Pete Olson in 1973. And this year, 40 years later, I'm going to be relinquishing my responsibility as the director of the fellowship program. Uh, we've had, I think, about uh, 70 fellows over the years. Uh, about half of them are in the practice of community hospital pathology, uh, where they, most of them also have responsibility for the blood bank in their hospital. The other half are in full-time blood banking, either in blood centers or in academic uh, medical careers. Uh, the director of blood banks in a number of different medical schools are former fellows here. Probably our all-time uh, uh, most successful one is a guy named Brooks Jackson, who's the chairman of pathology at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, who was a fellow, uh, I don't know, about 25 years ago. The other kind of neat thing about Brooks is uh, uh, he met his wife while he was a fellow. She worked for me. And uh, they met and, uh, you know, they've been um, married ever since. So uh, uh, it, it was, uh, it's kind of a nice connection. Um, there's another piece of connection to Brooks, which I'll come to in just a minute. Um, uh, the, the, I mentioned the, the bone marrow transplant lab, which evolved into the, the incredible cell therapy lab that we have today. And that's been one of the things that, that I had put a lot of, uh, effort into. Uh, I did uh, some cell therapy kinds of research myself, but also 
uh, spent a lot of effort developing that laboratory, getting the facilities and the staffing and that sort of thing, and making it responsive to the needs of the medical center. Um, Brooks, or, I mean, um, uh, Dave McKenna now uh, is the director of that laboratory. Uh, he was a fellow, well, I don't know, six or seven years ago. It's perfect. It's just the way you want to see things. You know, he was interested in that. Uh, he moved into it and, and began to take on more and more of those responsibilities. I could step aside. Dave now is the director of that laboratory and he's doing a fantastic job. So I feel really great about having a key role in developing that lab and positioning it so the next generation can move in and take it forward from here. Um, the other um, uh, thing that's uh, uh, evolved uh, over the last few years is uh, uh, that I've become uh, involved in international work. Um, I, these things somehow just happen sometimes. Uh, um, uh, I've always done a lot of international travel and things, and it, because I was reasonably well known from uh, National Red Cross roles and as the editor of Transfusion I would often be invited to go to international conferences or speak in other places. Um, but uh, especially the, the focus uh, that I've developed, uh, that I've built around is the developing world, um, uh, particularly Africa. Um, uh, we've, uh, as, as I continued to get to know people more and more, they would ask my advice. And sometimes I would go or, or give my advice about things. And then um, over the last 10 years, uh, there have been a couple of federal programs that have made money available uh, to uh, work to improve blood availability and blood safety in the developing world. Uh, one of the major of these programs is called PEPFAR, P-E-P-F-A-R, President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief. And it's really a broad AIDS-related program, but blood safety and transfusion transmissible HIV is a key part of that. And so uh, we were fortunate enough to get a couple of contracts under that program uh, to work in Tanzania. Uh, I collaborated with the American Association of Blood Banks where uh, my wife worked uh, before we got married and she moved to Minnesota. And she managed their PEPFAR program, which involved about seven different countries. Um, so uh, currently we have a, um, a CDC contract to work in Tanzania to help their national blood program increase the number of uh, donors. And we just completed uh, four years worth of work in Afghanistan. That was really an experience. Uh, it was the same sort of work in that we had been working with their national blood program to, uh, not only to help strengthen them in general. So uh, testing methods, uh, training their laboratory staff, helping them establish criteria for blood donor selection, uh, teaching them uh, laboratory methods, uh, training physicians about the appropriate use of blood, uh, also training midwives, because uh, one of the major uses of blood, not only in Afghanistan, but in the developing world, is maternal hemorrhage. Um, uh, actually, Afghanistan has the highest maternal mortality rate in the world, and the largest cause of death in women is hemorrhage. So if you can increase the availability of safe blood, you contribute to improving uh, maternal health. But also, the midwives are key. They have to recognize uh, early on when there's a problem. They have to know what to do about it. So part of all this was training programs for midwives uh, as well as physicians. Also training of nurses and, and lab staff. Uh, and I must say, the, um, we've, various of us, we've probably been to Afghanistan over four years, probably a total of maybe 12 or 14 times. Uh, there have been probably 20 of us all together that have gone in various combinations. Um, I wasn't on all those trips. But um, our experience in Afghanistan has been just outstanding. The people have been very, uh, supportive, very grateful that we're there, very respectful. They've been wonderful to deal with. Uh, they've been very responsive, uh, as opposed to some of the sorts of things we've tried to do in some other countries. Uh, when you go to Afghanistan and you work on some things, and you go back three months later, and they're doing it, as opposed to some other parts of the developing world where it doesn't work that way. And I, I just want to give one little vignette about this. 
Um, this was about a year and a half ago. Uh, one of the uh, training programs that we put on was uh, training for about 50 Afghan physicians in um, uh, clinical use of blood and appropriate transfusions. And um, one of the things, of course, that's a common part of physician education is uh, the use of the hemoglobin to decide when to give a transfusion. And usually there are some guidelines that are established, hemoglobin values, above which it's thought that most patients won't need a transfusion. The usual value uh, these days is seven, seven grams of hemoglobin. And this is part of what the training in involves among many, many different things. Three months later, we were back there. Uh, I hadn't been on the first visit. I was back on the second visit. Um, which involved midwife training. And uh, one afternoon we went to a women's hospital. Uh, one of the people that, had, that was with me is one of our university trauma surgeons, James Harmon. And, and he and I met with the OBGYN residents in this women's hospital. And we were going over some cases and one thing led to another and, and we uh, somehow, the indication for transfusion arose and the residents said, Oh, we use hemoglobin of seven as our indication for transfusion. Well, James and I were both a little taken aback. We said, wow, we can hardly get our own residents to do that. What's, uh, tell us about this. Well, it turns out the director of their residency program had been in the physician training program three months earlier. James had been there. And, uh, and when we met with that training director later that afternoon, they remembered each other and immediately started talking everything. And we asked her about it and she said, well, you know, I was in this training program and then seven was, uh, and so now we've instituted that with our training program for our Afghan OBGYN residents. So it's a very narrow point, but uh, it illustrates the kind of uh, interactions that we had in Afghanistan and the kind of responsiveness that we found in those folks. Um, and as it's turned out, the national director of their blood program uh, we had him over here at the U for three weeks of training. Uh, he's now in the university MPH program. There is an online program. Uh, it's an executive uh, MPH. Much of it he does from Kabul, but he's here, I think, over the course of two years. He'll be here four different times of two weeks each time. So he's very proud. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. We've got yep. about five minutes. Okay, I'm about finished here. So he's very proud that he's going to be a, a graduate of the University of Minnesota. Actually, this guy is really outstanding, and I think he could very well end up being the Ministry of Health over there someday. He's very well regarded within the ministry. So I've uh, spent a lot of time here, um, uh, I, I, but I think you know I've I've really hit on the highlights of uh, what I'd like to say. And uh, the things that really stand out to me over my career, first of all, how in the world did I end up in the frozen north? Uh, but um, I've had many opportunities to leave, and when I add it all up, the university, the department, the way of life here, um, everything else, uh, I've, I've stayed. Uh, and I think that says a lot. Um, but the ability to put together the regional blood center and the university uh, created all kinds of opportunities that many other people didn't have. And the background in internal medicine uh, enabled me to do things that, that those who came through pathology weren't comfortable doing. So it led to the bone marrow processing lab, uh, it led to a lot of early work in, uh, in blood cell separators and apheresis, it led to the national marrow donor program, it positioned me to be the editor of transfusion. And uh, the last thing that I've got my fingers crossed for, and if it happens, that's going to be right up there with the National Marrow Donor Program and the editor of the Journal Transfusion. We have a, um, uh, a, an app, a grant proposal in uh, to carry out a 1,000 patient clinical trial in Uganda of uh, a, a, a blood that is treated with a new technology which will inactivate any contaminating viruses or bacteria in that blood. So you would have disease-free blood transfusion. I never would have guessed in my career this could be true. But the technology is, is developed. It's, it's widely used now in Europe. It's poised at our FDA, which we hope will approve it soon. But all of that 
you can't do a clinical trial like this in the developed world because there's not enough transmissible disease. But in Africa, there's a plenty of transmissible disease. So we've designed this clinical trial. It's a thousand patients, and we'll be looking at HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, malaria, syphilis, and bacterial contamination. And we hope to prove that this technology will prevent any of those diseases from being transmitted. If we pull that off, that's right there with the National Merit Donor Program and the editor of Journal Transfusion, and I'm going to feel like I've had a great career.